everybody this is Mirabon or on shot and we're live at tennis summit 2022 and i'm really excited to be here with my friend john craig from performance plus tennis to talk about technique and actually analyze videos that have been submitted from the audience which is super exciting you know every time i ask the audience for this uh you know kind of shuts down in minutes as far as how many we can take so uh yeah excited to, to be here with you john how have you been I've been great. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful spring out here on the West Coast and uh, the sun's shining bright and the leaves are out and uh, flowers are blooming. People are playing tennis. Uh, everything's great. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I, I look out and I see none of that here. Well, maybe the tennis parts, uh, you know, somebody's playing. But yeah, it's uh, that's very nice to hear. So yeah. And uh, like I mentioned, I've got six clips here from uh, some folks who sent in their clips and really excited to look at them as well as uh, mine as well. So if you haven't already, you should definitely check out John's um, fantastic session breaking down my serve. Uh, you know, I, I was, of course, like slightly nervous, but, you know, I thought that it would be great service for people to see, um, you know, the, the flaws that are in my technique. You know, I'm sure pretty much everybody can improve their serve. So uh, I think you'll find it very insightful. So definitely check out John's video after this session. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess we'll just start with a couple questions. Well, actually, before that, I just want to say hi to a few people here. Peter, how's it going? Michael, how are you? Um, Tracy, hey again from Minnesota. So yeah, just to, to ask you first off, um, uh, John, what in your mind are yeah, a few of the, the top um, fundamentals or keys to having good technique? That's a great question, and I think that one of the things that uh, so many players overlook is they spend so much time trying to perfect their tennis strokes, but the strokes are typically compromised by movement first. So, you know, mm -hmm. balance and rhythm and, and timing really begin and originate through footwork. And so the goal is to try to blend footwork and stroke work together to make a, a nice flowing movement that is well-timed with the ball. And I, I think that the balance and the rhythm components need to be better understood so the strokes become more natural. Hmm. Love that, love that. And um, in terms of um, the serve, uh, I guess, you know, maybe we can kind of, that'll lead into like uh, to, to my uh, video analysis as well. I mean, what are some of the biggest issues that you see with the serve in terms of the, the you know, the technique that, that really robs us of a lot of um, power and uh, consistency? Well, I think one of the main things that most adult tennis players struggle with is tension and um, understanding how to eliminate tension from their movement. Uh, and, and that helps the mobility as well. So tension and mobility are big factors. Uh, balance, again, is a key element to the serve. Um, you know, ball placement control is a key element, of course. And then really understanding the mechanics of what really leads you into and through all the key elements and positions of the serve and how you tie that together. Those are really key factors. Um, you know, a lot of players do struggle with the grip as well in the classic waiter's tray position, but there are certainly drills and exercises that, that players can do to alleviate that and eliminate that. But the tension's a big, big factor. It's a big limiting factor as well. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that, John. So I think what I'll do now is um, bring on my clip because I know we have six others to do, so I don't want to, you know, uh, blabber on too much on my end. Uh, oh, hey, Jack from New Jersey. Um, kind of close by, I guess. But uh, let me share my screen and get the proper screen to be shared on here so that we can um, look at uh, my serve. So yeah, so I'll just play this in real time and then uh, let you know, you can give me your observations and I can scroll back and forth. Um, uh, so here we go. Sure. Yeah, I bounced the ball quite a few times. Sorry for that. Um, <laughs> That's okay. You're, you know, Novak bounces it more than that, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mean, with my serve, you know, I feel like it's all right, but I, I know that there's a lot more power uh, potential. And uh, I was wondering if, you know, you had any um, initial thoughts as I, you know, scroll through this kind of more slowly. Sure. Um, so just let me know whenever you want to. Sure. Start. Well, well, we can start right here, and you know, you start with your racket up, which um, is really like I think I, I said in my review video 
that's that's a okay because we're all trying to get to that position with the racket anyway. So the fact that you place your racket up is not an issue for some of those who are watching. If that's something you do, that's really not an issue as long as the racket tip is is off to the right as as shown here, or even straight up would be fine. So that's not an issue at all. Uh, the weight set up on the back leg looks pretty good. Great, excellent, excellent. Um... And then I know you talked about, uh, and you know, I don't want to give away the entire <laughs> presentation that you did for, for your session, but I mean, how, how important are the alignments of the, the feet and the legs and any, any common mistakes that people make with that? Yeah, you know, I'm really an advocate of the platform stance, which I see that you're doing here. Um, but your, your right foot is beyond parallel to the baseline, where your left foot is pretty close to parallel. So if we were to look at you from the side view, your, your feet are, are, are splayed apart from each other. So what, what that will cause is that when you flex your legs, you're actually going to be bowing your legs apart. So you're really not using the muscles in a balanced way. Um, and you're also, you know, potentially going to aggravate your knee because you're, you're, you're not bending it in a true sense of it being a straight lever. So I would be just cautious about that. And again, this kind of feeds back into, you know, having the appropriate balance to, to swing from. So if we move the clip, when you, when you move into your trophy position, um, you can't quite see from here, but you've got a, you've got a good leg, leg drive developing here and good knee bend. Um, I would just, from the side view, we would see that your right knee is bowing away from your, your left knee. So I'm not mm. sure you're quite getting the true balance from both legs fully um, at this point. So you can gotcha. take away that a little bit. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I was trying to bring a, a side view, but I mean, it's no worries if we can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if uh, we can just keep advancing. Uh, so, yeah. And then, you know, what's, what's very interesting, mm -hmm. um, Oh, well, first off with the, the, you know, the feet, feet alignment, it's funny because I, you know, I, I did hear from coaches and I mean, this is, you know, correct and all that, but like that it would facilitate the hip turn and coiling. If I were to, um, move my, I guess, point my back toe, my back foot's toe a little bit outwards, but then, you know, as we kind of talked about on a, a separate call, you know, it, it's still, um, the, it messes up with the alignment. And it's funny because I, you know, I was doing some shadow swings and then I put my feet, you know, back in the, the normal alignment. And I, I did feel a much more stable base. Okay. So I thought that was, that was really interesting. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, just doing it, uh, how much of a big difference that it makes with just a little bit of a, of a turn of the foot. Um, so I really appreciated that that advice from you. Yeah, and I think that, you know, again, I think that for everyone, no one's exactly the same. Everyone's a little bit different. There's no true right or wrong. We're just we're just experimenting to find what works for each person that's better. Um, mm -hmm. And I do feel as though that you'll you'll get a better balance that you'll you drive both legs from, not potentially uh, injure that knee by getting it out of alignment as well in the long run. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure, for sure, and um, and just maybe just a couple other things to note. I mean, okay, so as far as this the knee, the amount of knee bend. I mean, what? And you did just mention that you know there are obviously are variations among different people, and you got to see what ranges work for you. But I mean, any thoughts on you know how much the knee bend should be made on the serve, and like should there um, be some some sort of like minimum or maximum? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, you're approaching what almost 90 degree bend there between your thigh and your, and your calf. That's, that's pretty deep knee bend. Really. It's really good. I mean, Boris Becker was very deep and other players get deep. You don't need to be any deeper than that. Um, I would make sure that you, that you have a good, almost a straighter line from the back of your knees to your shoulder blades. Some players, you know, they, they bend their knees and they tend to squat, but if you squat and stick your, your tush out, you actually weaken the movement. So you actually want to tuck the tushy is what I tell my kids. Tuck the tushy. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't, 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 don't protrude it out. Don't squat because it'll, it'll just weaken the movement. So from there, maybe a little bit straighter line from the back of the knees to the shoulder blades uh, would strengthen up your balance. But I think your knee bend is, is more than adequate. It really is. Got it. Yeah. Oh, Got yeah. it. And I, and I, great. And I can't resist, but to, um, bring up the uh you know the side view i just want to be uh i guess as thorough as possible here so uh i do have that here 
So yeah, if you can, you know, I guess you can see, right. The, the bowing of the legs basically is what you're talking about here. Um, or you were talking about, right. Yeah. And when you're, when you begin to push, you'll see that your knee is your right knee is push is out towards the corner. And then that's, then it's pushing from there. I would rather see it be more in alignment so that both quads are lined up right over the knees and the feet are the feet are in better alignment. I think when we're talking about fractions here too, we're looking for, to help you get what that extra 10% out of your serve. Right. So yeah. little adjustments can make a big, big difference. So, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Appreciate that. And then uh, I guess in terms of the uh, I'm trying to move this, uh, it's kind of rough here, um, but in terms of like the racket, drop and then you know because it does seem like it's pretty late uh you know that i'm doing because usually when you see the videos of the pros like their their drop coincides with the pushing up of the legs but here i'm starting to drop the racket and i'm still nowhere near you know pushing yeah. off i guess considering you know the uh, relative amount you know time i guess right. but um yeah so any thoughts on on that and how how that affects the serve yeah, let's go back to your trophy down. position. So right about here, I mean, if you look yeah. here, fundamentally, this looks really pretty good, okay? I mean, you're in a really good position. That little adjustment of the leg is a minor thing you can work with. But otherwise, you look like you're in a great position. But this is where um, the sequencing starts to fall apart because what happens is the racket begins to drop uh, independently of the body moving. And so yeah. what happens is your legs are your legs are not in sync with your racket drop. And right. see that, and now your left arm, which is really a catalyst to the movement as well, is still in the same position. So, mm -hmm. um, as I pointed out in the video, which everyone can go back and look at in today's presentation, the timing of the pull away of your left hand and the drive of your legs is out of sequence with your racket drop. Yeah, uh, and you can see up. your racket. Your racket's almost at the bottom here, but your left arm really hasn't pulled away. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So that should kind of. So the the left arm or, you know, whichever arm you're tossing arm that you're using should be, I guess, right soon after this should be dropping. Like yeah, once, the trophy. You, once you get into your trophy position where you've got a good, strong stretch with the tossing arm, uh -huh. uh, the tossing arm and the leg drive are going to trigger the racket drop. So, mm -hmm. so at this point in time, you, the left hand should be pulling away and the leg should be driving upward and that'll cause the racket to drop naturally where it looks like you're trying to create a swing by and this is really so common in rec tennis mm -hmm. we're trying to focus we focus so much on the swing that we're actually making trying to make a swing but when you're in this balanced trophy position um and, and you make the right move and you're relaxed the racket should fall and rise by itself yeah yeah yeah, yeah ex exactly yeah and i appreciate it. and we did get a question and hello everybody um appreciate your uh comments here uh well we not said hi to uh john hey from uh victoria bc john. sue hey from massachusetts um christopher oh excellent here we go watch your analysis of mirbon served you suggest the feet be aligned back foot directly behind the front foot in the platform stance what do you think about that uh, john? great question you know i think the feet should be in alignment i think it's okay to slide the the right foot in your case further behind the left a little bit. What I do is actually tuck the the um, the art I tuck the right foot into the arch of the left foot. So my right foot is actually mm -hmm. about halfway you know behind. If yeah. you can imagine that. So the the ball yeah. of my right foot is tucked into the arch of my left and I slide it back with hip width apart. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Appreciate yeah. that. And uh, let's see Cynthia, hello everyone. Hello to you. Um, <laughs> Tracy, should your racket be pointing a bit more forward at this point? Very good question. What are your thoughts, Craig? Or John, um, that's okay. <laughs> that's that's kind of individual style. Some people will have it a little bit more forward. I think Roger has his a little bit more forward, but I think that your racket is in a natural, comfortable position, um, ready to make its move to play the ball. So, uh, yeah, I think we also have to separate to some extent what our foundational things or fundamental things versus style. I think that's just yeah. a little style thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, got it. Got it. Excellent. So um, I'm not going to be too uh, greedy, I guess, yeah, on mine. So let's go to. All right. So we have David M here. I guess I'll just just in case I'll refrain from last names. But uh, let me just share this. It'll take one sec. Um, let's see. Oh, stop screen. OK, share. 
And yeah, I hope everybody is enjoying this session. I definitely am, um, you know, getting the expertise from John here. It's extremely valuable. So uh, let's see, David. And so we're, so oh. we're, shif we're shifting off your video. So just as a wrap up on your video, Marban. Oh, I just, sure. Just, I, I really encourage everyone to, to look at the, the, the presentation. It was, it's about 12 minutes where I did a complete analysis of your serve. And really look carefully at that. I think it's going to help a lot of you who are, and actually you're going to see maybe hear a couple things that you've never heard before that are going to help your serve power and timing and coordination in that video. So. hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I really highly encourage you. I mean, I watched it. It was fantastic and i um, really looking forward to continue to practice what John uh, suggested for me. So uh, some huge, huge things. Um, so here we go with uh, David serve and um, I'm going to play it and then, uh, and let me move this um, cursor thingy. Uh, and then I'll go back in slow mo. So here we go. I like the abbreviated motion there. Okay. Um, so I think that was pretty much it. So, um, let me know, uh, you know, if you want me to stop at any particular point in time or anything. Yeah, we can go right here, it's a good spot, right? A little bit further along. So right here, you'll see that that uh, it's David, correct? Yes. I love, I love uh -huh. the setup, David. It looks really good. I like the way you're, you're uh, set up on your front foot, ready to rock back. I can see you're in a continental grip. And I like the racket being on the angle that's slightly underneath. And you see, you know, players do that like Milos Ranich. And, and I think that sets up the feel uh, for the swing really well and helps alleviate uh, a waiter's tray movement. Uh, when you have the rackets underneath a little bit like that. So I definitely like your setup here. Uh, let's see what happens as you move from here. Sure. And you shift back beautifully. Mm -hmm. And your hands separate away. Here's where we can stop right here, a little bit further okay. back down, a little bit a little further back. What I'm really an advocate of is leading with the left hand. And if you watch most of the servers today in the modern serve, when they're moving into the serve, the left hand is the leader. And, but we've historically been taught down arm, arms go down together, up together. But if you if your arm if your playing arm like David's doing here is rising at the same time as the left arm, it inhibits you from getting into the trophy position. So as we we carry on here, we'll watch what happens. And his arms rise, and we can tell he's a pretty athlete, pr pretty good nimble athlete. But look how both hands are up high now. Yeah. And really, in this position, he's got such a high elbow. High elbow, yeah. It's gonna it's gonna inhibit his movement. So at this point in time, we would love to see the elbow being in alignment with the angle of his shoulders. And you know, I I'm gonna guess that Davis is a pretty good athlete. He's probably throwing a ball. If I just tossed a ball to him and said throw the ball, his elbow would be sitting right there where it's supposed to be. Mm. It wouldn't be up high. If it was a football or it's a baseball or whatever. So I would suggest that you really try to emulate that that position like you're throwing a ball yeah yeah mm -hmm. got it got it got it so excellent so i'll just go slowly again and mm -hmm. if there's any other observations feel free high elbow uh, legs look pretty good and let's uh -huh. watch it push with the legs and let's watch that left hand okay, okay. so i'm going to do a little giveaway here on this one that's part of what I recommend it to you as well in the video is when we go back up here and David starts to make his move, look at the position of his hand uh -huh. and see how the palms facing the camera. Mm -hmm. you will, if, yeah. you look at, if you look at every pro, when they're in this position and they're about to pull the left arm away, they will rotate the hand uh, around to the left so the palm is facing forward. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is a power move. And when your when your palm is facing forward, it 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 eliminates the restriction in your shoulder to pull that left arm away. It makes it very comfortable to be the trigger that gets that that driving motion to happen with the shoulders rotating. So right here, I would rotate the hand. And again, David, if you go and watch the presentation, uh, you'll see the examples that are in the presentation with Marban, where you'll see virtually every player is going going from a position where the palm is up or facing back to rotating towards the target. And then the arm pulls away. Big piece. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It seems so small, but you know, it's, it definitely makes a huge difference. So brilliant stuff. And then any other thoughts as far mm -hmm. as 
what's happening afterwards. I mean, the racket drop seems pretty good. Um, but see how the left arm is really not not pulling. It's certainly not. It's it's actually inhibiting him yeah. a little bit here. At this point yeah, in time, at this point in time, the, the left arm should have should have pulled away and start to get mm. tucked underneath, so that the palm is facing upward and it's a strong position. So, and I can I can uh, maybe show share a screen here. See if sure, feel, feel free. My, yeah, I can I can. Uh... Let me see if I can share my screen. Yeah, you should be able to. here. Take a look at Novak's hand, and can you see that, John? I can't see it yet. Maybe if I remove mine, let me try that. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, and then yeah, just click the settings uh, or sorry, share button, and then uh, we're able to click mm. the uh, share button. Um. Yeah, it's not really working. I don't know what's going on here. Try it. Oh, no worries. Oh. It's you could send me the link too through the um, private chat if you want. Let me see if I can share it. Yeah, no worries. Um, oh, there through. we go. I think. Uh, oh, yeah. So right now I see your screen. Okay. Uh, so if we just take a look at these positions, and this is an interesting one. Look at the position Andy Murray's hand is in here. See, a lot of people think Andy Murray throws his left hand to the back. But he doesn't do that while he's coming into contact. He actually locks the mm. left hand underneath and it holds his yeah. body steady and stops the shoulders from turning. So the energy of the shoulders can drive through the swinging arm. So that's a classic one of Andy because people think his arm's just flying back. It's actually not. And then if we look mm. at Milos Ranić, look how his, his left arm is actually cupping underneath. It's holding him in position. Mm. See that? And if we look yeah. at Novak Djokovic, on contact, there's the left hand holding again. Key piece, key piece. Mm. Yeah, mm. love that. Yeah. Thanks. For and that, here's, John. A, here's a good here's a good picture of Roger. And there's the angle that that I was talking about with David that we'd like to get. Yeah, to do. see that the elbow, mm -hmm. right, with right. the shoulder. Yeah, I yeah. love that. Yeah. yeah, and the feet there. Yeah, that's good yeah. stuff. Okay. Excellent, John. Uh, um, all right. So I'm gonna remove like, your screen. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to my back. Uh, uh, do you want me to keep uh, sharing your screen? Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, cool, great. So, uh, is that on, it on David? Was there anything else, or pretty much? Oh, uh, let's go back over to, to David a little bit here. He had a couple of different serves. I looked at this earlier. It looked like he hit one where he was trying to hit more of a kick serve, and then one he was hitting a flat serve. So, I just want to look at that. Uh -huh. Let's take a look at that position right there. We don't even have to go past. Oh. All right, let's keep going. And that looks really good on edge. And this yeah. is where the serve is misunderstood. If he keeps keep going one more clip forward, that looks really good. And one more down. He has very little long axis rotation in his shoulder. Mm. So he rotates from the edge to the ball, but then it stalls. And then he's just reaching. And I, I think in your video with you too, from a side view, we would see David's arm reaching forward towards his target. In reality, mm. that's not really what happens at all. Um, what I'd love to see is uh, David keeping the elbow in that position and letting the shoulder rotate over and getting the hand lower than the elbow. And I will show you again here. I, I've got to go back here and sure. share um, my screen, see if I can yeah. do this again. Um, am I there? Uh, let me see. I don't see your screen up yet. <clears throat> um. I can try to remove, let's see, I'll remove my stream now just to double check. Um, but yeah, if you click share and then I guess your desktop or however you want to do it, should work. The same way you did before. I don't know, maybe it's just taking a lucky. bit of time. I got lucky before. I think I got lucky. Got lucky. <laughs> um, uh, while, we're, while we're trying, um, as soon as I see it, I'll put it up. But Janet asks, haven't videoed my serve yet. Best to take from back, from side, or both. Um, I thought that it would back and side. I mean, what any thoughts on you know best practices for videoing? Both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially the front, the front side, right? If you were going to choose, or would you say one is better than the other as far as side views? I would say front, front side. Yeah, and then back for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I don't know if we're getting there. 
Uh, yeah, for some reason it's uh, not sharing yet. Um, okay. I don't see it up here, but it's okay. Yeah, but I, I think if you trying. look, if you look at and, and my point being is that I we, we don't want to throw the arm towards the target. It's a, it's a myth. Once we get into contact, we we want to have a long axis rotation, and the racket string should now be facing off to the right, and the elbow should still mm -hmm. be up. Elbow should still be up, and the hand, the playing hand, should actually end up lower than the elbow before the upper arm comes down. And that position it really uh, activates the long axis rotation that we want to get on the serve, which is mm -hmm. which is also called pronation, but it's long axis rotation from the shoulder. So yeah, it makes you think of the, the pictures of um, Pete Sampras, Pete Sampras. how much he uh, yeah, it's uh, iconic. Great stuff. Well, <clears throat> thank you, David, for sending us your clip. Oh, I don't know if there was, sorry, was there, was that pretty much it, uh, John, or did you want? Well, I think if we go to the next serve he hits, uh, let's take a look okay. at this one. I think this one, he's, he's a little different. He's trying to hit more of a spin serve and you'll see he'll turn it yeah. over it's right there. See that where he can go back one little level up where he's really trying to do the dirty diaper. I think maybe the diff's also yeah, the dirty diaper Jeff. concept. <laughs> but the dirty right. diaper... The dirty diaper position is the byproduct of using the long axis rotation of the shoulder. So it will happen by itself if he rotated away and way off to the right, then that would be that position would fall into place perfectly. And that should even gotcha. happen on a flatter serve. Mm. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Great point yeah. there. Great point. Yeah. Excellent. All one, right. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Well, um, <clears throat> Appreciate it. And uh, David, I hope you got some great info about uh, your mm -hmm. serve. I cer certainly did. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> thank you for that. Let me just close that out. And then let's bring on the next one, which would be, I think, Mike Rod or Mike R's forehand. So let me share the screen once again, and we'll get that on in just a second. <clears throat> um, Nice looking court, by the way. So let me just move that uh, little play button here. Okay, so let's <clears throat> play this and uh, then I'll do it in slow-mo. Yeah, and, and what I would say where we're watching it, Mike, is I, I love using a ball machine, but what I'd love to see you do is set the ball machine up so the ball is shooting off to maybe the middle distance to the right and then, mm. and then uh, time the, the ball, the, the interval, so that you can recover. So again, hmm. be, be practicing your strokes with the footwork uh, because that's what you're going to do when you play. So uh, it really helps to blend the footwork and the swing work together. Um, I see a good unit turn with the left hand. I like it. Looks pretty good there. Um, mm -hmm. Let's take a look from here. There are a couple of them where you get jammed up and we'll take a look and see. Yeah, good unit turn. Pretty good. Um, Sometimes you get a little long right yeah. here, right here. You get a little long, and and you got a, you have a straight arm there, so that pretty much bottlenecks you into having to hit the ball with a straight arm. So if you imagine for a moment you've got a straight arm stretched behind you, and as you come into contact, you have to flex your arm because the ball's too close. It will greatly weaken yeah. the swing. So mm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would try to keep the arm from getting too straight behind you and you'll have a little more versatility with your contact point as well. Okay. Mm. Which contact on that one looks pretty good. Look at the position of his elbow, uh, out and away from the body. Pretty good there. That looks pretty solid. Mm. Yeah. Weight shift looks nice. pretty good. Yeah. Nice. One thing I noticed is this less, you know, second kind of shift with the left foot. I mean, is there anything you know, right or wrong with that? Is that pretty normal? You see the last second kind of. Let's take a look here and see. Yeah. Do well, you see I, that on the. Yeah. yeah. Do you mean the timing or the, or the, uh, the pattern of this step? What do you think? Uh, well, just more, I don't know. It feels like he, he sets initially and then at, you know, the last second he does the left, uh, you know, or maybe I'm just, you know, because of the the slow mo, I'm I'm kind of like overthinking it. You know, that's okay. Is that a normal adjustment step? You know, at that mm -hmm. this point. Yeah, okay. because see, because see, he has time and space. So, um, so you close that time and space gap by by making an extra step or two, okay, and to keep okay. a rhythm of movement. And I would say that, um, for me, I feel as though when I put my left foot in, I don't think about stepping forward, but putting it into the shot. It's 
kind of the catalyst that triggers the swing to come. So again, I'm coordinating the timing of my step or my footwork with my swing work to to create an athletic coordinated movement. I think the timing there's pretty good. And I like the fact that his left toes are pointing off to the right net post because that, that, that takes away the, um, it allows the hips to rotate naturally. You know, if his left yeah. toes are pointing parallel to the baseline, he'd be locking up his hips. So it looks pretty good. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And then left what are your just looks- general, th- Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Left hand looks really good. I like the way he's stretching it out to the ball. It's very good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, as far as, um, you know, the stance, like I know obviously there's a lot of debate of, you know, open stance, closed stance. I mean, for these types of balls, would you prefer um, that Mike and others, uh, you know, in, you know, use the stance right here? Uh, uh, or would you want them to use like more of a open stance or vary it up? I know there's different, you know, um, you know, depending on the situation, you want to use different stances. But. Yeah, I think when the ball comes down the middle of the court and you have time and space, the best balance to swing from is the one that Mike is presenting here, uh, where you what we call what a neutral or a classic stance. Um, when would we use an open stance? When we run out of time or space, we're pulled wide or the ball's high. So, but when you can get set up for a ball and have your neutral stance, I think it does produce a, a better balance for a medium height ball. Okay. Now, in this yeah, particular John, is one, this the jam? Yeah. Yeah, let's watch it. Yeah. yeah. He's jammed here. Jammed, yeah. Yeah. And now, look, yeah. we're we're never not going to be jammed sometimes. I think the key is, sure. is to anticipate you're going to be jammed before you actually are so you can make a subtle adjustment and still make the shot, not make a mistake. Um, so, yeah, just and I think that he, he probably understands that he gets jammed in on it. But the fact that he uses his left arm to, to stretch out before he plays the ball should help him. Uh, let's... Let's go back a little further in this this particular form again. Okay. Yeah, his left hand's there, and then he clears. Okay. So the left hand's stretching nicely. And now the left hand needs to pull away and and trigger that shoulder rotation. But see, he when he hits this one, Mike never really gets mm. his shoulder turned. Look how his shoulder's back and he's jammed up. It's just a it's just a position thing. Very common. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So when we're too close to the ball, it's either because we misjudged the ball or we didn't have the appropriate footwork to get into the position. So that's why the footwork is so critical um, to make the adjusting steps to get your position right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what else here. Um, okay. Yeah. And then in terms of the the you know the length of the swing, like you mentioned, I mean, do, do you have are you you know, opposed to that at all? Like, would you want him to make it more abbreviated to help with, with uh, the timing and, and whatnot? Or what do you think? Well, I think the key would be to adapt to different balls. So if the mm-hmm. ball were to come in fast, it would be skillful for him to be able to keep it more compact. I can't imagine he would be uh, able to absorb a, a fast serve with that forehand on a return of serve because it's a little long. So his ability to keep it on his right side and not get behind him would be be a be a, uh, a skill he could work on. He could almost feel like he's hitting his forehand with his back against a wall or against the fence, and not let it get back behind him too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just curious too. I mean, I you know, and I'm guilty of this too, especially with the ball machine. So I mean, it, you know, it's it's not um, it's not unique. But would you like to see like Mike and others kind of like being a little more aggressive with these balls here, like kind of moving forward or, I mean, maybe he's just practicing his technique. So I don't know if it matters as much, but I, I just, I find that a lot of players, including myself, were kind of not aggressive enough on balls that are slower, you know, when we could be. Yeah. I mean, I think when you, when you're playing, I, I, I one a coach, important coach told me once, look, take every ball at the top of the bounce. And that gives you a very specific um, movement to the ball so that you're not letting the ball come to you. Um, Unless the top of the bounce is above the shoulder, play every ball at the top of the bounce. And that really triggered my footwork because it it gave me a specific purpose to get into a certain position of the ball. And the end result was I took time away from my opponent taking the ball earlier. Um, So yeah, anytime you can set up and move forward to the ball, in this case, he could even do like a skip up or a shuffle step to the contact. That would be fine. Got yeah. it. Got it. Yeah. So, I mean, any other key takeaways on on Mike's forehand or, you know, also just any one or two things that he should focus on to kind of get more power and spin on it? 
Well, let's go back to this contact point on this particular forehand. Let's go. Oh, one, this one? Seven. Yeah, this one, this last one. And I would say that this, this could be the pattern where he's too close. His right shoulder has risen and he's jammed up. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. At this point in time, I'd love to see the right shoulder lower um, and the distance from the body further away and have his, have his shoulders facing the net more. So he's really using his core to bring the racket to the ball. Yeah. And again, that's a function of distance. Yeah, it's a function of distance of the ball. So he's got to just got get it. a little more range, got to get a little bit more, more range for the ball. Perfect, perfect. Um, yeah. Excellent stuff. So thank you for that, uh, Mike. So mm -hmm. let's go to, uh, I think actually Mike has another. Oh, this, sorry, this is Mike Rogers. We have a lot of mics today. <laughs> um, so, so let's go to um, Mike B's serve. So let me share my screen there. Um, and Mike B's serve. Okay, cool. So just bear me with me for one sec. Um, Mike B serve. Okay, great. So we should see that now. Uh, it's in portrait view. Um, so let me play it and then we can. Do it in slow mo after. Yeah. <laughs> okay, oh, that's a good one. Um, all right, so let me. Uh, Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Ooh, sure. Good. Oh, you mean this beginning? Yeah, yeah, or... yeah. Right there. If okay. you look at that position. It's beautiful. I mean, it, before he goes and makes a move, if we go back there against Stahl, his left arm's up beautifully. I love the way the palm of the right hand is down and the racket's in a beautiful position. Yeah. Um, his balance looks terrific. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a really good entrance into the serve. Um, if I didn't see anything past this, I would think, okay, this is going to be huge. So, yeah. you know, um, but let's yeah. go ahead and, and go to the next step here. And this right here, is what where I think things start to, to go wrong because mm. Mike's right foot is to the right of his left foot. And so now his shoulders are rotated back beyond his hips and he's not going to get a good unified movement into the ball. So, you know, there's a lot of players that use pinpoint and I understand that. In fact, when I went to the B&B Paribas Open last month, um, I would say that nine out of 10 of the pros were using pinpoint, especially on the mm. men's side. But, it's, it, it can be it can be trouble for a rec player. So if, if we're going to do a pinpoint here, Mike, you, I would like you to tuck that right foot in behind the left foot. The left yeah. the, Both feet are parallel to one another. Hips are lined up with your shoulders. And you'll feel more unified in your movement. Yeah, and I mean, I've, uh, I have a 5-0 slash 5-5 friend who, who uh, even does this, and I kind of chatted with him about it briefly, but, you know, it's something that he's been doing for a long time. So, um, yeah, it's good, good to point that out. Um, let's see. So I'm just going to keep going here. Any thoughts on the sequence of, the, uh, of both arms and, and the racket drop? Yeah, let's keep going. So you can see where the racket is dropped and the left hand is still up. Yep. And um, at yep. that point in time, and again, I encourage Mike to go look at the video that, that I did, the presentation today, and you'll see the examples of where the pro's left arm is when the racket gets to the bottom of the racket drop. And we want to really clear that left arm and then tuck it underneath so it feels like a pulley that's pulling the racket up to the ball. So there's a little, you're a little out of sequence there. And I think the best way to fix that and to isolate that is to leave your back foot back and just do a platform stance and isolate that. So, and then maybe you can go back and do your pinpoint later. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. It's very helpful to make things simpler uh, with the platform for sure. Um, yeah. I'll just run through it and just let me know if there's any other observations that you see. Looks good. You see your left arm is blocking you, isn't it? It's really, it's really inhibiting, inhibiting you because you see when you get in your trophy yeah. position, you have your shoulders are approximately at a forty-five degree angle, where your left shoulder is high. There it is, beautiful. And the goal is to reverse that, so the right shoulder is well above the left shoulder at contact. 
and the left arm has to pull away to get that shoulder to, to really clear, to get the shoulder up. And I would say that it, it could be better. It could be better by getting yeah. that left arm to pull away more. And I think if you were to use your, your legs the right way, I think you could also get more shoulder rotation as well. So. Got it. And when you yeah. say by the right way, uh, the right way, you mean like through the platform or anything? Yeah. Or to keep the right foot behind the left. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Or yeah. that. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Either way. Yeah. Yep. Either way. All right. Yeah. Just compare that to the other, other images that we have on the presentation and you'll see. Um, and again, I think one of the big things that, you know, adult tennis players on the serve really challenge or challenged by, and I talked about that is tension, but also mobility. Um, mm -hmm. And we're all different. We all have a different range of mobility, different stages in life, different ages, whatever, different <laughs> body types. Uh, but the more we work on the range of motions and mobilities with our torso, our legs, and our shoulder, uh, the better we can performance we can get and the greater chance of reducing injury, which is so important to all of us who want to play tennis for a lifetime. So work on your mobility. Yeah. 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 It's, it's so huge. It's going to help you uh, play much longer uh, sure. in life. So yeah. Uh, all right. Great stuff. On, uh, else. It's got a beautiful yeah, exactly. rock back. It's a beautiful rock back. Leads with the left hand beautifully. Look at that. Left hand's high, right hand's low. Everything looks good. I would just, that's where we start to get a little, little off the mark. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. Gotcha. Good stuff. So thanks for that. And uh, I have another clip from Mike, which is the forehand. So let's um, go to that. Let me share again. Just one second. And I also will get to the comments as well. I really appreciate the comments. Um, okay. okay. So Mike B is forehand. Um, all right, so we have this here, and I'll play it. Hmm. Pretty uh, abbreviated. Just drop straight down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely uh, want the split step. Got a split step in between. Okay. Yeah, we got a little viewer over there. Good. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's let's go let's go right back to the beginning, and we could kind of break it down. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So you know, I, I your first move looks really good right here. You've got a good shoulder turn. Both hands are in the racket, which is terrific. And it looks like at this point that Michael is trying to emulate, you know, more of that really modern forehand uh, where the racket goes down is flat to the court. Um, mm. uh, AK Roger Federer, you know, there's a few others that are doing that as well. Um, what happens though, is that there's no, what I would consider to call, uh, you know, the classic loop. And I actually liked Roger Federer's forehand earlier in his career more than I like it now. I think it's a better, it was a better example for most club players to emulate because it did have more of the classic loop to it. Here, uh, Michael is. It looks like he's going to form a loop, but then, as you mentioned, Marben, he's he's just dropping the racket down, and and then he has to reverse it. So it, the racket's actually going back in the same path that it's coming forwards. So it has to stop in reverse direction, um, and that really inhibits the momentum and rhythm that we're trying to get from a backswing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the purpose of a backswing is to create more momentum coming forward. And I, I think the way he's doing it here uh, is, is really limiting that, that movement. Yeah. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. yeah, I would say lift the hands and create a, create a circle behind you, create a loop. And let, if the racket closes a little bit down like that, that's fine, but let it happen naturally. Yeah. Bring mm -hmm. momentum to the ball. Yeah. I like that. And it's interesting. Maybe I'm getting too far ahead, but you know how the hands are maybe, not working together as much like this sort of kind of double mm -hmm. wrap here. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, uh, any thoughts on that or just, you know, any yeah, phases yeah. before? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I ask oftentimes ask my, my students, is there a, is there any similarity between a serve and a forehand? And they're like, well, no. And I'm like, well, think about it. You know, on the, on the serve, you're really trying to get a stretch with the left arm, which is really the setup to pull it away to get the shoulder rotation on the forehand. 
you want to get a good strong stretch with the left hand in this case, and then you want to use it to pull away and, and along, in conjunction with the legs to create torso rotation. And this, this crossover arm position here is uh, uh, obviously not what we want at this point in time. So the left arm literally blocked him from getting the rotation that he would like. Yeah. So once the left hand comes off the racket in, in his preparation in unit turn right here, we want to get it to have a nice strong stretch. So look how it kind of disappears next to his body. Right now it should be stretching out to the to the ball. Mm. And then it can pull away in a semicircle and you can get a good strong shoulder rotation into contact. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Like but in the stages, I would lift the racket from here and create the loop. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to guess that Michael does not like high contacts because the <laughs> racket goes down here. Yeah. And when you have a the more the looping type of a, of a movement, you can you can uh, raise or lower the system of your preparation to match the height of the ball. So you can hit it flat. You can hit it with any level of spin you want, even on a shoulder high ball. You just lift the system of your preparation up to match the contact. Um, and you can use that loop to generate momentum and adapt to the ball. Yeah, 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 yeah. appreciate that, John. And yeah, definitely, it doesn't feel like Mike is, you know, fully swinging. It seems like it's he's not hitting through the ball as much, and maybe that's a byproduct of his, you know, prior. Well, yeah, and and I would say if we just watch what his watch Mike's right elbow as he comes into contact. He's he's hitting the ball with his arm. Look at his elbow still still there. Like if we go back one frame back of frame the ball's gone but look where his elbow is and at this point in time i'm i'm more of an advocate of really driving through the shot from the upper arm and shoulder so there should be more extension where the elbow's further away from the body and then come around come back to you but he's he's really not playing the forehand with his torso and driving through his right shoulder it's more of an arm swing so i'm sure he's like yeah. man i'm not getting enough power i'm not getting enough juice on this thing yeah yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Good stuff. Uh, any other um, observations before we move on about Mike's can, forehand? Can you play it in regular speed for a second as well? Yeah, sure. Take a look at it. Okay. So. I, th I can't really quite tell, but I'm going to guess that his racket head speed maximizes after contact. So if if Mike, if you can lengthen out that uh, the the backswing, it's interesting. We had a, we uh, we had Mike earlier uh, with a forehand that was had a really long backswing, and now we have Michael yeah. who has a, has a very yeah. long back backswing. So it worked out. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? But I think in this case, yeah. we need to get more length of the backswing so you feel like you generate momentum through that loop to come to contact. And then, and then once you've gone out, extending out through the ball, the ball's gone. You can't help it. And I think the racket will decelerate and your swing rhythm will, will clear up, clean up pretty good on that. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, John, I mean, I guess, you know, there's instances where, where like the ball is going to come super fast. And then maybe in those cases, like, yeah, you know, just quick drop and then you hit it. But I guess uh, in most of the other cases is when you want to have that circular motion so you do you do do you do you have students kind of adjust depending on the circumstances yeah i mean it takes a lot of experience to yeah. react to a ball and make make quick adjustments but yeah i mean um when the ball comes in slower you can lengthen it out to create you know more rhythm in the swing more spin and then if you know you're returning serve you're going to keep it compact but obviously it takes years of experience to to be able to do all that but yeah you you do want to be able to make adjustments in your swing based on the ball you receive Ultimately, 100%, 100%, yeah. yeah. So uh, I guess we could move on unless there's any last uh, thoughts on on Mike's. Forehand. Let's take a look and see him finish it here. Okay, sure. Let's see him finish one more forehand, finish it off. Okay, so let's take a look at that one right there again. As as Mike hits this forehand, why don't we go back one frame? Watch his back foot actually kicks back. So we go back one frame, Marban, to okay. where he's coming into the ball. Look where his right foot is now, and look where it goes as he makes as he swings. Watch it go back. Mm, I see that. So that's an that's a that's not uncommon, and the reason that's happening is is that Michael's not getting the load on his right leg initially, mm. and he's he's actually stepped into the ball too soon. So if you think about what you do when you go bowling, think about what your back leg does when you go bowling. 
it kicks mm. back. It kicks yeah. back to counterbalance the forward swing of your arm. And in a subtle way, that's what Mike's doing here. He's actually on his left foot too soon, and he's not rotating his hips and, sh- and shoulders enough, so his back leg kicks back. So at the end of this forehand, it would be ideal for Michael to have his feet back into a square position where the right foot is off to the side, and he's basically in a ready position again. So that right foot shouldn't kick back. His hips should, he should push off the right foot, get a good strong rotation, and square up to the net. Brilliant stuff. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, mm-hmm. great, John. So that sounds good. And thank you, Mike, for sending. So let's see. We have um, two more. Um, let's see. So we've got Azair. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Actually, you know what? Let, well, I'll bring it up and then I'll also look to the chat. Uh, apologies. I know we have a bunch of <clears throat> comments here. Mm, let's see. So we have... Hey, Richard from Dallas. Very nice. I, I don't know if I had got Stephen from Mill Valley. Um, Blake from Montreal. Hello. Tracy style. That's right. A lot of, you know, some of the service style for sure. Uh, Lay. Hi, everybody. Janet. Oh, sorry. I think we saw that one. Um, uh, here's a question. I righty struggle to serve out wide to the ad side. Uh, is there a likely cure for this? John, any commonalities you see in players that struggle with this? Well, possibly stance. Possibly stance. Mm-hmm. Just t- check your stance and make sure you're you're really in a position that makes it comfortable to serve out wide to the ad side. Um, I, without seeing your serve pad, I really, I really couldn't be more specific than that. Um, I will make a comment about ad versus deuce. Make sure that you're practicing your your serve. Uh, much more in the ad side than the do side. Yeah. Yeah. And why, why is that by the way? Oh, is that just for this case or generally? Uh, are you in general, talking about in it? general. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. And what's the reason for that, John? Well, there, there are six scoring combinations in a game that, that are played in the, in the ad side that determine the outcome of the game. 40 uh-huh. love, love 40, 40, 30, 30, 40, add in and add out. In the do side, there's only two 40, 15 and 15, 40. So, you know, it's more important that we feel confident in our serve in the ad court. Obviously, important. We, but in the ad court, you want to believe in your serve wholeheartedly because that's going to be where more more games are determined. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, it's, uh, a lot of times we forget about those sorts of um, you know important things and and the uh, stats and and you know whatnot. So I uh, appreciate that. Let's see. Jason Bourne. I love that name again. Uh, welcome back. Is a pronation after contact uh, racket face facing right side fence important? Hi, hi, uh, hi Jason. Jason <laughs> uh, actually um, is a is a big supporter on on uh, my YouTube channel. In fact, he and wonderful. Uh, he came down from Northern California a couple weeks ago. Um, with his daughter and took a tennis lesson and it was a wonderful oh, brilliant. And, and love that. And he, he actually, uh, is recovering from, uh, from reconstructive knee surgery. So, uh, great oh, to wow. see you on here. Um, great question. Uh, is it important? Well, I think it, it is important because we're, we're trying to use the right technique, um, to bring the racket to the ball and it's on edge. It's like on a razor's edge coming to the ball. And then the power of that swing and acceleration comes through shoulder rotation. And the byproduct of that will be a racket that rotates out to the right to some degree. How much depends on mobility and individual body styles and so forth. But the action of having a a rotation from the shoulder, commonly called pronation, is important on the serve. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, John. Um, Which serve... Uh, which serve motion could cause rotator cuff injury? Is there a particular one or ones that uh, could cause that or any other issues that cause it? Well, that's a, that's, that's a, a, a complicated <laughs> question because everyone is different. Rotator cuff injuries um, can happen when you're, when your shoulder is t- completely inhibited. You know, the, the, the structure of a shoulder is a, is a, your humor, humerus bone has a ball on the end of it and that goes into a, goes into a socket and the shoulder has to float inside that socket um, and it's controlled. The rotation is with the, with the rotator muscles, but 
if if you get out of alignment in there and you keep doing that repeatedly, then you're going to end up with with aggravation, impingements, and potential rotator cuff injuries. I think that overreaching is a big issue um, because there's so much emphasis on reach, reach, reach. But if you overreach on your serve, just think of that ball in that socket and it's you know pressing against the socket as it's rotating through. Um, I think that's you want that that ball to flow to the socket not feel like it's pulling into the socket. Um, so overreaching upward and even overreaching forward can cause rotator cuff injury. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> appreciate that. Janet, uh, you're welcome. Uh, let's see. Christopher, long axis rotation allows the racket to do the work. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Uh, John. Slice versus flat. Are they similar swing paths except the pronation on the slice happens later so that the racket face is still on an angle at time of ball impact? What are your thoughts, John? Uh, I couldn't say it better, John. It's, it's, it's a oh. feel. It's a feel, but it, it, it's a subtle difference. But um, yeah, this, the, on the slice, you're, really, you're, you're trying to catch the edge of the ball a little bit more. So the, the pronation occurs actually a little later. Still occurs, though. Um, but it is a subtle difference and it's a subtle feel that, that you have, but that's, a, you've explained it perfectly. Yeah. Nice work, John. I wonder if you're a coach. <laughs> uh, let's see, Michael, great points. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Appreciate it. Uh, Christopher, um, wouldn't his forehand and sorry, I don't know if that's Mike's, um, oh yeah, I guess it is mm -hmm. yeah, maybe Mike's, uh, wouldn't his forehand benefit by swinging from the inside out? Yes, it would. And I think that the long backswing um, makes it almost feel like it's an outside in. So the, the combination of having a more compact backswing and clearing the body, the inside out movement will probably uh, reveal itself naturally. Mm -hmm. yeah, Swinging out stuff. away from the body. Yeah. Good point, got Christopher. It, it. Yeah. And that's, uh, I think Mike uh, <laughs> agrees with that. You need a shorter backswing. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Janet, I have same jamming problem often. Best way to improve footwork slash positioning to use ball machine? Well, you can use the ball machine um, for repetition, of course. Just make sure that you are indeed using footwork to move back to your, your, your control of the court and then back out to play the ball again. And if you can set the machine up so it plays the ball in different areas, that would be helpful too. Um, you know, knowing where the contact range is, um, and then judging the ball um, is really the, you know, the gateways to getting your contact in the right area so you're not jammed up. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, John. So, Mark, how often do you do these video analysis? Well, um, you know, during the summit last year, I did this once with Jeff. And then this year, I've obviously got it with, with John, which has uh, really been fun so far. And then we have another video analysis session of player submitted videos uh, tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. So you can definitely tune into that as well. So there's the two that we have. Um, but, you know, maybe we'll do this again in the future, you know, past the summit. So uh, definitely stay tuned. Uh, maybe we'll we'll set that up. Um, so I'm glad you like it. I'm assuming at least because <laughs> you asked. Um, Christopher, I feel a lot of tension in his forehand. And so I'm not sure which, which uh, forehand you're referring to. Maybe it was... Uh, because we have two mics as well. Oh no, we had a yeah, Mike R, Mike R, and Mike B. So, but I think it was did the you, first. Did one. you notice the first one? Did you notice that as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and you know when I talked earlier about the tension and the serve, and uh, I talked and I haven't really talked about tension in the forehand. But for me, what I feel when I enter into my forehand, well, first of all, in my ready position, my left hand, I'm a right-handed player. My left hand is controlling the racket, so my right hand is just sitting there floating in the forehand grip. So. When the ball comes to my forehand, my left hand actually initiates the unit turn. My right hand just goes along for the ride. Mm. And that also allows me to establish the lack of or the level of, main, of, of tension that I have in my grip and in my arm. And so when the left hand releases the mm. racket, it just it's just relaxed and soft so it can just be move with freedom. But my left hand really is is the is a key to that that helps me establish that that lack of tension, if you will. And going back to the, the to the mic with the long take back on the forehand, if you, if you hold the racket with your left hand longer, it will, and then release it um, instinctively when it's time to swing, 
it will allow your swing to be more fluid and have a more compact movement to it as well. So I find the left hand on the forehand is actually kind of manages the forehand. It manages the setup with it, the preparation, the timing of the swing, helps me with my contact, and gives me a goal for the finish. It just really helps organize and bookend the forehand. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, we'll take a couple more for now. Uh, Christopher, or John, what is your feeling on racket lag in the forehand? All the top pros do it, but I believe it screws up most club players. Mm -hmm. What is your take? That is a great question. And when the concept of lag and snap came out like four or five years ago, I was immediately jumping on my YouTube channel and talking about <laughs> lag and snap and what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. So go check those videos out because they're really a couple of the most popular videos I've ever done. Mm. Um, if you have the appropriate tension and the appropriate movement and you're, and you're coordinating your movement correctly, the lag will happen by itself. Um, it's not something you're trying to produce. And I think the problem, the, the challenge with club players is they see the pros do it and they try to go out and do it. But it's not something that you're trying to actually have happen. It'll be a byproduct of the proper movement and the, and the appropriate lack of tension in your swing. Excellent, excellent. And one last one for now. Linda, hey, Linda. Uh, excellent comments regarding ad side. I'll share with my team. Thank you. Um, no, thank Good. you for following. And thank you, John. And uh, now... Azair is here to, so we can <laughs> review your back end. So there we go. Fantastic. Um, all right. So let's play this and then um, we'll, uh, we'll go back in slow-mo. Yeah, it seems like it's um, a lot of arms involved there. But yeah, what do you think, um, John, uh, trying to see where to put this cursor here? I wish I could make it smaller. But um, yeah, initial thoughts. Okay. Well, you know, on, if we compare the two and a backhand of the forehand, on, on the forehand, I'm really an advocate of getting the hands up and away from the body. But that's really not right. true in the backhand. Once your hands rise up and get away from the body, there becomes a natural disconnect between the arms and the torso, and then you end up swinging with a lot of arms. So mm -hmm. I would encourage you to, to, to uh, you know, analyze, for example, Novak Djokovic's backhand. Watch where his hands are when he takes the racket back. The racket is definitely above his hands, but look how high your racket is above your head. And and so that's going to cause a disconnect between your, your arms and your mm -hmm. body, your torso. So you're you're probably going to end up swinging with more arms. So let's take a look here and see where we go. But the overall pattern of your swing is pretty good. That's a good position. Dropping mm -hmm. and coming in. Good weight transfer into the ball. Great. Con look at that contact. Beautiful. Yeah. That looks great. Good extension through the left arm. Good finish. Left foot comes up. So... This is, this is a very interesting backhand because other than just a bit of the high hands on the take back, there's a lot more I see that is really fundamentally pretty good about this backhand. So maybe we can ask some questions if, if, if you want, Marban. Yeah. So people, people see if they can answer the question. What would you do to improve this backhand from what you see in the video? Interesting, huh? I know. I have my ideas. Does anybody else have an idea they want to pop in? Any ideas coming through? Uh, let me let me scroll down to see if there's any yeah, ideas. Any yet. ideas? Look at that context, beautiful. Yeah, it's nice. What's lacking that we could add to this backhand to this yeah, video? Think about that. Think about that for a bit and answer. Anybody coming up with any questions? Or any answers, I should say. <laughs> I asked. So we've got, yeah. <laughs> so we've got Pat backswing seems high. Um, Jason more shoulder turn. Mm -hmm. Christopher legs. Um, Azera himself says getting to position early when I analyze when I analyze my video. Um, let's see uh, recoveries. You know certainly. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, some of you are on track. So. 
I believe and really advocate that the that the footwork and the rhythm of your legs brings your swings to life and and really transforms you as a player. So what's lacking here is stationary positioning. So mm-hmm. I would be doing a dynamic split step that leads me into a rhythmic movement yeah. with my legs to the ball and create rhythm around the swing. And it will bring, you've got a good swing. I would be careful about the high take back, but I would just build more rhythm around it through your footwork and see where that leads you. Uh, because the swing otherwise looks, uh, stroke looks pretty good, but it's the footwork part that's really lacking for me. Got it. Got it. And, uh, also is there, I mean, I don't know if there's any other questions you want to ask right now in terms of like, if you're a part of it, if you're swing that you feel uncomfortable with, or if you're having trouble creating, you know, power or spin or anything like that, you know, you can ask us before we move on to the next video. Um, but yeah, uh, John, any other observations that you wanted to bring up or thoughts? Um, and I know, I guess one that I'll ask is how about the, you know, the angle of the racket face? Like, do you, did you, would you want it more closed at all? Or do you like, you know, the angle, like any thoughts on that? You know, the angle looks pretty good there in the back. I'm not really a big fan of having a, a excessively closed racket face on the two-handed backhand. If you look at, again, if we look at the model two-handed backhands in history from David Nelbandian to Novak Djokovic, Andre Agassi, so forth, you won't see uh, much of, of an extremely closed racket face. And I think as a consequence, they generally tend to hit the ball a little flatter on the two-handed backhand. Um, mm-hmm. So th- I think that's fine. Um I, I, I think that this weight transfer looks good. He's got the back heel in the air. Uh, again, I just think the high hands are a little bit of an issue. And uh, he's just got to learn how to get more rhythm and athletic movement in and out of the shot with through his footwork. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And then actually, uh, Azir asks or, or says, I struggle with high balls on the backhand. So any thoughts on that, um, John? Great question. You know, the most comfortable way to play a high contact, let's say shoulder high, is with a semi-open or open stance because you can rotate your shoulders uh, back into the ball much more comfortably because your hips are not as closed as your shoulders. And you'll see that a lot amongst the tour players where they'll, they'll play a, a wide backhand or a high contact backhand or return a serve backhand with a semi-open or open stance. Um, mm-hmm. And then when you, when you play that, that position, you want to feel like you're, as you play into your swing, you want to feel like your right shoulder drops out and your left shoulder rises. And um, so your left shoulder is up like this as you're playing into contact. Your right shoulder drops out and your left shoulder rises in, up into the ball. And that'll help you play that high contact with the stance. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, John. And then also, as there says, open and close stance on the two-handed backhand. I don't know if he means that it's having trouble with that or what. But um... You, you got to be able to do both. And you got to yeah. be able to do a dynamic uh, open stance as well, where you actually can move through yeah. it. Um, it's important that you're able to, to adapt your feet to the ball based on how much time you have and space, and also the height of the ball as well. Yeah, yeah, got it. Excellent. Um, Great stuff. So I guess, uh, I mean, we can move on to the next video. Uh, Do you want to do that, John, or? Yeah, I think that, I think that, um, unless there's other questions, I think that's, I think that we've covered this one. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks, Azir, for sending that to us. And now let me bring up this video from, let me double check. It's who it's, it's from Matt H. So this one is actually on YouTube, which is awesome. He put uh, a match on there of him playing. Uh, let's see here. Let's give me one sec and window and Matt versus Matt. Okay, great. And let me max, well, let me move this and then maximize it so everyone can see a little better. Oops. Um, okay. That should be good. So let me try to get it. So he wanted us to look at his serve. Mm-hmm. So I'll play it and try to get the timing, right? Oops. It's a little bit tricky with, uh, with YouTube. Um, so let me, let me put this on slow-mo actually, which this is a good trick for everybody. Uh, mm-hmm. If you want to watch uh, videos in slow mo, even if they're they don't they're not you know normally uploaded like that, you can go to this um, this tab here, 
playback speed and then 0.25 and uh, that'll put it uh, very, very slowly. So any uh, initial thoughts on that? It may be harder to um, kind of pinpoint each time, but uh, exact places, but. Okay. So we can go back a couple of frames here. See, see right as, as, as uh, Matt is entering into the serve. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty good here. And then he makes his first move. He shifts back. And he raises that left heel. Okay, so mm -hmm. what's, what's the left mm -hmm. foot here? So, so to be clear, I, I think that your weight should be slightly back when you go into the tossing phase. Like you shift, you rock back, and then you hold steady with the weight slightly on the back foot to counterbalance the movement of the left arm rising. But when you start to lift the left heel, let's keep going another frame here and see what he does here. Keeps lifting. And the ball's up. He never really gets that foot down. So he takes a step with it. Let's watch him take a step with it. It's and now the, look at the step. Look at the foot moving forward over the baseline. So he's a, I, I, Matt. I'm really an advocate of, of setting the left foot. You can move the back foot if you want to be a pinpoint server. But I would I would learn how to be more stable on the left foot uh, and not raise that that heel up in the air. Okay. Because it's it it gets you into a an, into a back foot position where you're back foot dominant, and I think you'll see that right here. That the only way you can take this step with your left foot is if all your weight's on your back foot. Yeah. And when you're loading up in your trophy balance position, it would be ideal if your legs were sharing your body weight uh, equally, so you're balanced. Mm. So you can use both legs to drive drive up into the ball equally. Okay. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I I know there's been like a debate on this as well as like a lot you know some uh, coaches say that you you've got to like load your back leg so I I don't know if that's where this is coming from where um, uh, Matt just is like overloading the back leg maybe and then not having any weight on the front um, but yeah yeah and it's it's it, you know we're looking for power so you know we do things instinctively to get more power so for him. You know, maybe he played baseball, whatever. So when you throw a ball, you you step with the left foot. So he's maybe doing that to try and get a weight transfer for more power. Um, what happens, though, is that, and they're subtle things, but the, the movements in the serve have to be sequenced uh, and coordinated uh, properly. And if you're off a little bit, it, it depletes your power and control substantially. So I would I would try to take the work out of this. He, Matt looks like a big, strong athlete, doesn't he? Yeah, <laughs> but I, I yeah. think that we could we could probably predict that his serve efficiency is pretty low, and if he were able to to coordinate and sequence his movements better uh, and have a better balance to swing from, he could probably have a lot more power and control. So definitely, definitely. Yeah. So let's see, let's just look at it again, see if there's any other thoughts. Go to trophy on... position. So if we get the ball up before he. Okay. That's... So notice that his in his trophy position, we'll call this his trophy position. Notice how his left arm is never really extending. So he's not getting yeah. into a good, strong balance. He's just got all his weight on his back leg. Um, and so it becomes kind of like throwing a shot put or something, which is, not, which is way too much back leg dominant. And he never really gets into a good, strong load. Um, yeah. So that needs to be, to be improved. Uh, at this point in time, I'd like to see the back heel down and the left arm straight up and strong, stretching from the lat, and the back heel risen. Virtually mm -hmm. every player, ATP, WTA, high-performance player, when they're in the balanced trophy position, the back heel will be up, and the left foot will either be down or slightly up. But the right mm -hmm. heel will be higher than the left. And the reason is, and if I could possibly, I, gosh, I want to share my screen, I really do. Let me see if I can uh, sh try sharing it again. Um, share my screen. Am I sharing yet? Um, um, share. Can I share? So let's see. I would love. Yeah, because you, you could. So you, yeah, you'd click share, and then like, um, 
uh, then you'd click whatever option you like and then click again, like with the window or, or whatnot. Um, but I don't okay. see it yet. Let me Here, see I if I can. It. I got it. Oh, oh, fantastic. Okay, great. I got Let it. me get. Yeah, cool. Uh, so I added you. There's your position. There so Roger's got his heel up a little bit. He's got his right heel higher than that. Right? But everybody gets into that position in the trophy, pos in the trophy position that balance position so yeah. and it, it's just different styles and different ways that they do it but they're all getting there um just trying to see if i've got something else here yeah i got pete here he raises his heel here or his toe here but then he puts his foot down and he raises his back heel see it mm, yeah yeah now the reason why let me move this out of the way the reason why he gets a better knee bend in the back, and so does Roger, and raises the heel is because the right hip is lower than the left hip. See that? Mm -hmm. Right hip is lower than the left hip. And the left arm's strong stretch up. That's, so that would be an ideal position to be in. So if we go back over here and look at Roger's, you'll see that the angle of his hips, more knee bend on the right, heels, heels up higher, and that's a very good balance to be in. Gotcha. Yeah. Looks good. Looks good. Um, let's see. So I can, I'll put this one back. Whoops. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. So let's see. Are there any other thoughts, John, that you might have on the serve here? Let's take a look here. Hmm. Let's keep going here. Well, and again, once it, here, I look at the serve like a, like a, almost like a mathematical formula. If there's seven steps to a to a math formula, and you get the third step wrong, does the answer ever come out right? No, <laughs> almost never, right? So <laughs> once you once you're off, out of sequence or out of balance, the rest of it is just you're just compensating and working hard to try and make it work. Um, so we really have to do it in stages. So everything that comes after that trophy position is going to be compromised because the trophy position in itself is compromised. So if you can get stronger here and get a good load um, and a good balance, then we can look at the things that happen after this because a lot of times these are just compensations yeah, for products. what this position is. Mm. So yeah, yeah, got it. But let's got let's it. look at it a little closer. Let me see if there's something else I can see here as well. Mm -hmm. good, good strong legs isn't he yeah yeah definitely Let's, can we go back one frame again one or two frames just a little bit here let me try to just let yeah. me know when to stop I'm gonna yeah. go little by little <laughs> yeah it's perfect That looks really good right there. Mm -hmm. And For the uh, racket drop, sorry. Yeah, I mean, he gets into a beautiful racket drop position. Yeah. And let's see, one frame up from that. Pretty good. One more frame. Okay. He almost looks like his arm gets straight before he gets to contact. So mm. think about it. if you were just, if if your arm were to get extended and then you went to contact, it would absorb power from your swing. So you want to feel as though your arm gets to the comfortable extension into contact, not before. Looks like mm. you get there a little early, and that's going to compromise your power as well. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And as, the, yeah. as the arm, as the racket's coming up on edge, it's coming up on edge. The coming up as you get near the extension the shoulder begins to rotate and that's where the action is right there. Um, but if you come up and you extend and then go to the ball, you're losing power and you're also um, risking injury as well to your shoulder. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha. Great. Yes, he gets up great in the air, doesn't he? Yeah. Good yeah, job. Matt. Athletic. 
Awesome. But I think this is this is the case, Matt, where if you focus on position, improving your positions and your sequencing, you're going to get more power and more control with less effort. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, cool. So yeah, I guess uh, any other closing thoughts on that, or where you think we're good? On the I would analysis? just look. I just look really closely. You know, ball placement and balance are your passages to a great serve and really it's the serve is 90 percent the first half you get the ball in the right place and you're in the right position to play it uh the rest of it can fall into place but if you're compromised then you're going to have problems so beautiful got it got it cool well i think that is it for our clip so that was uh, a lot of fun and uh whoops we don't want you to see that uh, <laughs> um but yeah, so I really appreciate that, John. Um, and just generally, you know, what, what have you been up to lately? Uh, any projects we should know about or just kind of to educate the audience about what, you, what you're up to? Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm the player development manager um, at the Newport Beach Tennis Club in uh, Newport Beach, California. We have a pretty vibrant junior program and we just expanded into a new location um, to another club in Huntington Beach. So I've been overseeing the uh, expansion to there as well and hiring some new coaches and training coaches. So I do spend quite a bit of time in the club environment and, um, and I spend about 20 hours a week on the court as well. Online, I have uh, my online company called Performance Plus Tennis. I've been uh, actively doing it for about four years and I really enjoy it. It is my primary focus all the time. And in fact, the first quarter this year, I've been tied up with some family things. My moms need a lot of help different things. So I really haven't done that much, but my, we're finally getting settled in our new location and um, uh, looking forward to getting back active uh, online again. And it's, it's been, it's been kind of interesting to take a little bit of a break. Uh, I've missed it tremendously. Um, and I just feel like I really want to help as many tennis players as I can around the world um, improve their skills. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back at it. In terms of projects uh, specifically, um, nothing really specific other than uh, what I'm doing with my YouTube channel and the courses that I have available and so forth. Um, and that's that's about it. Um, no real big projects right now. So, Got it. Got it. Good to know. Yeah, you do a lot of great work, John. Um, let's see here. Just checking some other comments. Uh, let's see. Did we get to this one on the search? Uh, on the serve just before contact is the wrist moving forward or left to right importance of left to right hand movement on the serve thinking of Sampras that's a great question Pat thank you for for, for that um, I think that, that the role of the wrist on the serve is widely misunderstood and you really shouldn't be trying to actively use your wrist your wrist will go along for the ride but it is not the uh, origin of power or control it really comes through the torso, through the shoulder rotation. And if you look at Sampras's serve carefully, other than the uh, ulnar deviation where the wrist actually extends this way, there is no flick. There's no flipping going on. It, it rotates through, and at the end, it's still fairly straight. Um, and you can watch the action is really coming through extension and rotation from the shoulder. He's not trying to flick the wrist if 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 the wrist is moving it's it's a subtle incidental consequence of the of the movement it's not intentional so excellent excellent let's see what do we have here pat m looks more like a shot put move landing far into the court but off balance on landing good observation yep. um pat thanks so much mm -hmm. so insightful and specific yeah for sure that's what john does um let's see <clears throat> Alex, any advice for a serve fix where the back leg kicks to the side after contact? Hmm. Any thoughts on that one? Well, there's a couple of things I've seen over the years that cause that. One of them is being compressed uh, at, at contact so that your body's leaning off to the left. So your right foot will just kick out to counterbalance your so you don't fall to your left. So if you're if you're crimped or or down low and you're bending off to the left and not getting your body up, then your right foot's probably going to going to kick off to the right, uh, just just instinctively for counterbalance, um, and opening up too soon. So if you're if you're not in a good stance and you're not getting a good unified movement into the serve, 
uh, and you open up your hips too soon, your right leg is going to have to go off to the right as well. So you've got too much, uh, er, too much early torso rotation. Yeah. Gotcha. So we can we can even take a look again. Like I can now that I know how to share a screen, maybe I can share a, a screen here. Sure. Yeah. So we'll, I want to I want to share uh, share screen. Okay. Um, and I will show. Am I shared it yet? Is it there? Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, good. It's here. So if we look at Roger, for example, look how his hip is still behind him. It's risen. This is a great sequence, by the way. I'm going to show you guys something really interesting. This is a great sequence, Roger serve. Here he is in his trophy balance position. What I love about this is it shows the value of the leg drive. So as we talked about earlier, he's got this hip, hip angle on a 45 or close to a 45. Good knee bend, heel risen. I put this line next to his shoulder. So you can see where his shoulder is in relation to this gentleman's head here. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Now we go to we go to image number two. His hips have certainly made a rotation over as he's driving off the le back leg and both legs actually. And this line represents where his shoulder was in the trophy position. Look where it is now. Wow. Yeah. Huh? Isn't that amazing? And then it if is. we if we go to the if we go to the final position contact look where his shoulder is now in relation to where it started Isn't that crazy in the angle of his hips but see the leg isn't out to the right because he hasn't really rotated his hips around that much has he? he's more shoulder over shoulder action hmm. see that so originally there's his load matt take a look at that okay and then look at that position hmm. and then look at that position wow so hmm. Do you think that the leg drive has anything to do with lengthening his swing? Tremendous length, length of swing. Mm -hmm. Imagine if he, imagine if he did the same range of motion in his swing, but his shoulder stayed right there, versus getting up there. So he added a lot of length and rhythm and movement and power to his swing through leg drive. See that? Yeah, it's a great sequence. Yeah. It's a great, great sequence. sequence. Yeah, it's amazing that that's where his shoulders started and that's where it is now. You know, <laughs> so, okay. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. Excellent. Let's see, Let's see if I can. My screen. Oops, there we go. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. So, thanks for that, John. And <clears throat> so, Jason, good question. Great presentation. Will this video be available on YouTube? So, this video and, and all the others, what happens with them is they're up for 48 hours from when they go up. Um, this is a good segue, uh, and I'll put John's um, link up here. But um, mm -hmm. basically, uh, I would love it if you would support John, and if you haven't yet, uh, to get the All Access Pass, because, you know, as you know, there's a lot of information here, including, you know, in this session and all the 40-plus other ones, and uh, it's it's kind of like having a library where you can refer back to it um, with the All Access Pass, and, you know, it's just a one-time payment of uh of 97 so i'm gonna put the link up there and then by getting it through john's link you would be supporting him and all the awesome information uh and analysis that he provided today so uh definitely would be great um and you know there's a lot of stuff that you get with it as well including the um audio files and the transcripts and uh even a free set of strings so it's definitely a great deal for sure a lot of a lot of great information um but yeah, John, um, any any other uh, last thoughts just generally on technique, on what we've seen today or, or anything else you want to want to close with? Yeah, I think that there's so much information available in today's world, which is so great. Um, so a lot a lot of tennis players become fixated on technique. But I, I just encourage encourage you to really stick to the foundational principles and let your style evolve. I think it's uh, a mistake to try to s emulate a pro that you like because you're different. We're all, we all have different body types and different body styles, ranges of mobility and so forth. So get your foundation right and let your style just evolve naturally so you look like a natural player. Um, and I think that'll help you not only play your best tennis, but also help you reduce in injury and uh, make you just enjoy the game more and more. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent, John. So, 
Very good. And uh, thanks, everybody. I'll just check it last couple. Um, oh, yeah. Pancho Gonzalez, best serve ever. Is that one of your top serves, John? Uh, yeah, Pancho Gonzalez's serve, definitely. I mean, he, you can look at the original images of Pancho, and he had the beautiful movement in, in, his, uh, in his motion that um, um, most people didn't understand back then. And um, I actually work with uh, Pancho Gonzalez's daughter, uh, Andrea. We work together at the club. I've worked with her for seven years. And um, I taught her son, Pancho's grandson, to serve. And uh, she says that I'm the only one who can teach to serve like Pancho. So I'll, I, guess I'll take that for, I guess I'll take that for what it is. Wow. But uh, yeah, I work with Andrea. <laughs> and I did have the pleasure of playing with Pancho in a pro-am in 1991 here in Newport Beach. And it was a great experience. So, yeah. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, John, well, uh, thanks so much. And again, everybody, I put in the link to uh, support uh, John if you get the All Access Pass. Um, again, I, I think you should get that to, to have that library of information and refer back to this presentation as well. But I really enjoyed it. And I hope that everybody um, did as well, especially those whose clips they you know were submitted. And then you can catch uh, me live later today in the evening with Jeff as well, who's a good a friend of both of us. And yeah, John, thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, anywhere else uh, or any place that you'd like people to go to, to visit you and check out your work. Well, if you go and, and look at the presentation that, that uh, we did on, on our band Surf today, there's a couple of links down below. And uh, one of them is to my Surf Foundation course, which has been far and away the most popular course that I've had for about four years. It's helped uh, thousands of players around the world really understand the foundational principles of the serve. And um, that is uh, available for you at 50% uh, off during, during the Tennis Summit. And uh, there's a coupon code called Tennis Summit 2022. I don't think that's the exact code that's there, but it is Tennis Summit 2022. And if you punch that in on the checkout, you'll get a 50% discount on my Surf Foundation package. And uh, that will really get you on track to uh, building a professional quality surf. Brilliant, brilliant. Excellent okay. stuff. Uh, thank you so much, John. And we got some really nice comments here again. Minka, excellent presentation for all of us to widen our knowledge. Sir John is excellent. Yes, thank you. I like that. Sir thank John. you. Uh, excellent. And then John says, John Sir Foundation course is excellent. Boom. There you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I've been playing tennis for a long, long time. And uh, my wife's she, she's like, gosh, you just never get tired of tennis, do you? You know, I go to work, I come <laughs> home, get the computer, do this, do that, answer questions, <laughs> look at videos, help people. And no, it's just, it's a, it's a lifetime love and um, it's very, very special to me. And nothing, nothing makes me happier than helping people get what they want in tennis. It's really a thrill for me. So thanks for all the support. Love it. Yeah, you do an amazing job, uh, John. Appreciate Thank it. You. Appreciate your passion. And Tracy says, thanks, John Mirvon. You're welcome, Tracy. So, yeah, thank you, everybody, uh, for attending. And for those of you on the replay as well, hope you uh, enjoy this one. And, uh, yeah, thanks a lot, John. And I'm sure we'll be, uh, you know, in contact again soon. So I appreciate all your work uh, on, on you know, the session that you recorded and then this one today and, and everything else. So uh, looking forward to chatting again soon. And, and thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Here. Take Enjoy care. the summit.